Hi, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, how I developed a, a, com a, a Comedia uh, uh, operator for Kubernetes or a Kubernetes operator for Comedia, one way or another. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, why I think uh, it's a good approach to running Comedia on Kubernetes and uh, some of the aspects uh, of the software and how it works. And I will try to demo it as well. Um, yeah, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, quickly, who I am, then a quick definition of what a, an operator actually is, um, why uh, an operator might be a better approach or, or it might be necessary, like what are the challenges in running Comedia on Kubernetes? Um, I will start the demo and explain a little bit about what I'm doing. And then we go back to the slides while the operator is working because it takes a couple minutes to bring up the entire Comedia system. You might switch back to the terminal to see how it's doing on the way. Um, and then I have a couple more slides about how the operator actually works um, and uh, what I think the benefits are of using the operator, for example, compared to Helm. Um, and uh, then a quick summary and your questions and uh, discussion, like uh, what you would like to know more than this quick summary that I've prepared um, or suggestions maybe, what you would like to see in the operator if you have looked at it already. Okay, let's uh, get right into it. So my name is Stefan Bethke, or if you want to pronounce it in the uh, more English way, Stefan Bethke. Um, I'm a software architect at T-Systems MMS, um, have been working there for a long time as a Comedia specialist. Uh, before that, uh, I worked at Talents. Um, I've been doing Comedia for almost 20 years now, or close to 20 years. Um, I've worked on quite a number of projects and uh, what I enjoy most is really the, the kind of hardcore customization and extension, like delving into the depths of Comedia, not so much the front end stuff, but like uh, really getting into the nitty gritty details and, and building cool things around and with Comedia and integrating it with other systems. Um, so let's start with what actually a Kubernetes operator is. Um, so you can read this. I, I stole this directly from Red Hat. Um, I think it's a very good description. But for me, the main thing really is uh, if you look at how Comedia, uh, sorry, how Kubernetes operates, uh, you have uh, controller software, you have controller instances that uh, look at uh, basically the key value store, the, uh, the, the JSON files that you can manipulate over the REST API. And they look at this data and they decide that something needs to change. So the uh, JSON files that we usually uh, see as, as YAML files, because that's more easily uh, uh, understandable to humans, but internally it's all JSON. Um, all, all these values, they describe the desired state of the entire Kubernetes system. And these controllers look at these values, examine the, the current state of the system, and try to make any changes necessary to bring it into the desired state. And then they might also give data back uh, in, in these uh, uh, values to, to tell you what state has been achieved. So for example, uh, if you create uh, a stateful set, uh, you tell Kubernetes that you want, for example, one pod, a certain image, you want that run. Um, and the controller, one of the controllers in Kubernetes sees that object, decides that it needs to create other objects, other Kubernetes objects, another controller sees those objects, namely the pod uh, object, and then starts up an actual container to, to run uh, whatever application you want run. Um, and uh, a custom uh, application custom operator is doing the same thing. It's not part of Kubernetes, but it runs on Kubernetes and it fulfills the same uh, purpose uh, it takes some description of the state that uh, you want the entire system to be in, and it then does things. Mainly, it creates other Kubernetes objects uh, that uh, make the application basically exist, like create the application, 
uh, in Kubernetes. It can do additional things. Uh, it could create database schemas automatically or, or uh, other things outside of Kubernetes. But uh, for, for this purpose, it mainly operates uh, in, within Kubernetes. Uh, by the way, if you have a question, uh, maybe raise your hand, write it into the chat. Um, and uh, I think we'll we'll get uh, to the end. At, at the end, we get to questions. Uh, if it's something really urgent, please raise your hand, and maybe uh, uh, Christian can can check if there's any important question and just uh, uh, jump in and and uh, like make sure I I'm aware of it. All right. Um, so specifically, Comedia. Um, so we started looking at running Comedia in Kubernetes a couple of years ago. And at the time, Helm was relatively new. I think the first Helm chart we did was, was even in Helm 1, and that was a pain. Um, and so we thought, oh, yeah, we will just do a Helm chart. That should be easy, right? You just need a couple of YAML files, and then you're done. And as it turned out, like uh, many, many person days later, um, Comedia is, is a relatively complex beast. And building a Helm chart that is reusable and that can cater to different scenarios is actually really, really hard because there's so much variation um, in that. Um, so there's many interdependencies. So you need to set the right things, not in one place, but in many places. And depending on how you want to structure the system, what, what kind of system architecture you want uh, for Comedia to have in your particular instance, um, it's hard to, to pull all of this together, especially given the capabilities or lack thereof that Helm has. Um, plus, there's a couple things that, that uh, are really hard to achieve because you need to talk to a Comedia component and tell it to do certain things depending on other events that are happening. For example, uh, you want to import content um, or export content or run a, a CAE feeder reset, uh, including uh, like uh, resetting or, or changing cores in, in solar, all, all these kinds of things. And even if that wasn't a problem, um, just the sheer number of objects you need to create can be really confusing. And, and like the, the Helm charts we've built um, are many thousands of lines of code and, and it's, it's really hard to understand what's happening there. So um, I wanna say two or three years ago, even like the, the idea of this Kubernetes operator came up, um, like this concept was introduced to me and I thought, yeah, that sounds about right. That, that, that is much more in line with how Kubernetes operates, makes total sense to have a, a specific a special Comedia operator that understands how Comedia works and simply does the right things because most often there is only one way uh, to do certain things or um, you can at least make a good assumption about this being a good way to do it and, and take out the complexity um, from the front end, from the users and, and hide that in, inside the operator. So that's why, why I decided that that is a good approach. And, and finally this year, I had the chance to uh, start developing that and, and use it in our current project. Um, let's jump into the demo um, and see if we can actually get this going. So uh, in this upper window here, I have uh, K9S running. Um, that is kind of a little console for Kubernetes. I hope you're all familiar with that, but it basically shows, in this, in this view, it shows the pods. There are no pods in the default namespace. If I switch to the CMCC operator namespace, we can see we have one pod running. That is the actual operator. Um, and uh, down here, we can see um, it just started up. So I, I uh, restarted the pod and we can see it's a Spring Boot application and it's running, it's, it's ready to do things. And I wanna quickly show you um, uh, what, what the operator takes as input. Um, so um, as I said, the principle of the operator is it takes some input, a description of the state the system should be in um, and then tries to achieve that. 
And uh, for this, you define your own custom resource definition, CRD, and then you create a custom resource. In this case, uh, let me see, there's a lot of uh, Zoom stuff in the way here. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, the the API definition, um, uh, that's, that's the designation, the ID of that, and then uh, it's called Media Content Cloud as the name. Um, and uh, this, CRD is, uh, or this custom resource is called example. Um, and then we have under spec, we have a number of definitions that the, the operator looks at and understands. And um, so um, for, for, for this demo, I decided I want content imported. I want databases created automatically. The database servers is including uh, any schemas that are necessary. Uh, we want to run with exactly one live CIE and uh, no RLSs. Um, I could instruct the operator to create multiple RLSs and uh, even create uh, a number of CIEs for that. Um, um, I want the management stage to be there. Um, you could leave that off if you wanted to. Um, there's a couple of defaults. So we're going to uh, create ingresses and I'm using the NIP.io service to have different host names for local host. That's uh, the 127.0.0.1. Um, and we're going to get a couple of host names under that. Um, the, I, all passwords that the uh, operator deals with, uh, like for creating secrets will be set to Geheim. Um, just so in my development environment, uh, I can easily connect to, for example, MySQL um, to, to uh, look at the database schema or something like that, or that's also going to be the admin password once um, uh, the system is up and running. If I leave that off, um, the, um, uh, the operator will create random passwords for everything um, and, uh, of course, uh, save them to secrets um, for, for use by all the components. Um, this is the plain blueprint, including the demo data. So I created uh, a couple of site mappings. Um, so uh, for example, we will have a host name that is corporate.127001 nipio. So we can access uh, the live CAE under that name. Um, but there's under that same host name, there will be additional uh, URL segments for different language sites. Um, so the operator takes care of uh, instructing the CAE as well as uh, um, um, building ingresses that that map the, those uh, those uh, host names and pass automatically to the right um, URLs in the CAE. And then um, we have a list of components, and this is very short, as you can see. It, it it's only management tools because uh, there is a number of default components that are basically uh, described with settings here. So management true means we will have uh, um, uh, the content server management, uh, the, the uh, master life server, the workflow server, and, and everything else that's necessary for management. Um, and delivery uh, will create the components that are necessary uh, for, for having a live CAE run. Um, and uh, what I define here are additional components, and these are uh, uh, first, uh, the initial setup of the CMS, including creating users. Um, and uh, the second one is the main data import. And as you can see, this is just a regular management uh, component, uh, the management tools component, um, and it runs these tasks. And I'll give it some config uh, to tell it uh, where to get uh, the data from. So in this case, I have prepared a, a PVC, a volume that has uh, the um, uh, test content as well as the front end zip um, in it, and it will import from there. Um, I also have set up a separate blob server. Um, that's uh, basically for the demo content blobs. So they don't have to be imported from uh, the um, uh, uh, content server import archive. Um, but uh, the content server will pull them directly uh, from a web server that is provided by this component. Um, and um, yeah, that, that speeds up the, the import quite a bit. 
So uh, what do we do to run this? So this file is called example YAML. So I simply do a kubectl apply. Let's see, do I have it here, kubectl apply? Yeah, still have it in the history. I put this in and you can see that uh, the operator is starting to do things. We can see that it, it is creating a MongoDB and a MySQL container as well as the solar leader. And we can see that the operator currently is waiting for these components to become ready. And that went very quickly. We see, okay, those three base components are there. So now we can start setting up um, the content management server and the master life server. And this will continue going. And I'll switch back to the presentation for a moment and we'll come back to this uh, in a couple of minutes and see how far it has gotten. All right. Um, okay. so. I, I already touched a little bit on uh, what the, the um, operator actually does and provides. So it can create a complete Comedia environment if you want to, including the database uh, servers. Uh, but of course, it can use uh, database servers from elsewhere, either something you've set up in Kubernetes yourself uh, with maybe another operator or, or a Helm chart or uh, some cloud service or whatever you have. Um, but uh, one, one really important thing for me was I want to be able to bring up a Comedia instance uh, without having to do too much work on my laptop. And I want to be able to bring it up and bring it down again um, so I can switch between projects. I can do that quickly um, and uh, without too much user interaction. Um, the whole definition that we just looked at, that was a custom resource. Um, sometimes uh, you might be allowed to run the operator, but you might not be allowed to have a custom resource in the cluster because the cluster is shared among different projects and uh, whoever is responsible for the cluster uh, is, is uh, reluctant to allow that kind of access to the uh, to the cluster. In that case, you can run the operator in your namespace and uh, use a config map instead of the custom resource. Um, you don't get quite the same support by Kubernetes for the syntax uh, because it's just a plain config map, but uh, the keys are exactly the same. Um, it's just all keys in the config map. Um, uh, the operator, as you could see, uh, brings up the components step by step. So um, it waits for the necessary components to be up initially uh, before it starts the ones that depend on it. So as you just saw, like initially the content management server, the master life server and the workflow server are brought up and only when those are uh, up and running do we do the next step, for example, uh, try uh, the content import and bring up uh, the CAE feeders and, and so on. Um, it can import content, as you saw, you have to configure like how exactly you want that imported through the management tools, but uh, you can very easily say what, what uh, tasks you want run with the management tools. And of course you can extend that with your own parameters and data sources and uh, what have you. Um, the operator can uh, automatically create a scaled, uh, can create scaled resources for the CAEs, for the RLSs, and for the solars. So uh, it takes care automatically of the differences between running with, uh, for example, just a solar leader or a combination of one solar leader and additional solar followers. And same for the RLS, you can run with zero RLSs, then the live CAEs are connected to the master live server. If you have at least one RLS, then the, uh, the, the CAEs are connected to those. Um, and that all runs through a service, of course. Uh, so uh, that is uh, uh, redundant uh, in that if one of the RLSs should fail, the CAEs will simply connect again uh, to the service and the service will direct them to the running RLS instances. Um, we build ingress objects. We can look at those in a second uh, because that's usually also a very complicated thing to get that right. And it was important to me that um, the, this kind of site mapping is all that you need to provide to have both the forward mapping from uh, like the URLs, uh, the 
browser sends to uh, the load balancer um, um, uh, and for them to be rewritten uh, to reach the CAE as well as the CAE configuration for the link scheme to do the right thing to create the right uh, URLs um, that are rendered in the pages. Um, the Anything that is a secret is uh, managed uh, by the operator. Um, that is actually also extensible, but uh, out of the box, uh, it deals with the database passwords and the UAP uh, uh, um, uh, secrets, uh, passwords uh, for the system users. Um, that is also extensible, and it automatically uh, configures the content server to uh, use uh, to, to um, update the database entries when it creates the database schema. Um, in all these 20 years, I've never changed the default system user passwords. Um, so I actually had to look up how to do that <laughs> and how the content server initializes uh, the database and, and the environment variables it uses or the spring properties rather uh, to do that. Um, finally, the operator does not really care what kind of Kubernetes it runs on. Um, so you can use Docker de desktop, you can use K3D or some other like Minikube or whatever. Uh, we are running this for our current project in AKS, but uh, it definitely works in EKS as well. Um, and probably, I, I mean, there's nothing special as long as it's Kubernetes and it's a reasonably recent version of Kubernetes it should just work. It doesn't really make any assumptions about what what kind of uh, Kubernetes you have or yeah, load balancer or, or stuff like that. The, the, the only thing that, that it currently is limited by is um, it needs the Nginx Ingress controller, but uh, we, we can get to that in, in a little while, like what Ingress controllers uh, are supported or might be supported in the future. Okay, let's quickly see how are we doing? Oh, we're already done. Uh, still waiting for import. So we can see that the import task is running. And if we look at the log here, we can see, yep, it is publishing. So that was really quick. That was nice. Um, so um, we'll let that finish. I, I go to the next slide and then we can look at the results. So you can believe me that I actually have a running Comedia system here. Um, all right. Okay, so uh, just almost as a summary. So um, I, I already touched on the benefits. So really quickly um, and reliably create a Comedia installation. Um, we, we really want to have the tooling to uh, do automated tests. And that means that our environments uh, need to be redeployed or it, it must be possible to easily and quickly redeploy environments. So we never want to be in a state where um, it's an environment has to be brought into the right state manually. Um, if there's any question about an environment uh, being out of spec, you kill it, you delete it, and you set it up freshly. And if the issue persists, then you know that something is wrong in your tooling, and then you can adjust that. And basically the same goes for, for um, even for the production environment. So worst case scenario, something is horribly broken. Um, we can bring down the entire installation, keep the databases and bring it back up again um, to, to just reinstall. So if, if ever we would have a situation where the Kubernetes resources are somehow completely screwed up and we can't figure out what the problem is, we could even delete the production environment and set it up again and be reasonably certain that it comes up okay because we tested it on QA or basically any other environment. Um, of course, uh, rolling updates, but that kind of is a given with Comedia, uh, with, with Kubernetes, um, but uh, it has been set up in such a way that that actually works. Um, so if if uh, you do an update um, and, and you uh, change the image version, um, Kubernetes will do rolling updates of all the components. Um, it was important to me that uh, everything has sensible defaults. So you do not have to have 5 million values uh, like you have in some Helm charts, or you need to write a lot of uh, 
redundant uh, descriptions of what you need or want, but that you have like a really compact description of what your environment should look like. Um, of course, it should be customizable because projects are always different and uh, you might have differences in the, uh, the scaling of your system uh, between say what you want to run on your laptop uh, versus on your uh, on your production environment and ideally you can do that uh, without having to change um, too much of the description uh, but only the scaling parameters for example um, of course uh, no comedia project runs just comedia there's almost always something else that you add so uh, for our current projects we uh, we, we have a bunch of uh, kind of microservices that do certain things and we wanted to deploy those alongside Comedia. So you, if you remember from the beginning when I showed the custom resource, the list of components also has the capability of defining your own components uh, with your own images and your own settings uh, relatively easily. And so you can add uh, additional components that are deployed alongside Comedia really easily. And if that is not enough, um, the entire project is open source, uh, it's on GitHub, um, and uh, of course uh, you are free to customize it in any way, shape, or form, um, and uh, hopefully it's something useful and you send me a pull request so I can add it to the operator. All right, uh, let's quickly look at uh, what is the, what, what the finished result is. We can see um, we're now at milestone ready. Um, so the entire thing is done. Uh, we can see the import finished and we have the running system and we can go to the overview page. Um, this isn't as fancy as the one that Comedia provides for the Docker Compose setup. Um, maybe somebody wants to uh, give us a pull request for, for a more nicely styled one, but we can see we have uh, the studio and the generic preview link um, and we have the direct links into the various sites and I can open the studio um, and log in as admin uh, with password Geheim. And um, so it's set to German, sorry for that for our English viewers, but uh, you'll probably recognize uh, the studio. I don't think I have to really sit, show a lot of that, but we can see it has all the demo content imported. Um, and uh, again, from the uh, overview page, I can, uh, go to the corporate site um, and uh, okay so that I actually didn't test so something is wrong here so the blobs didn't import correctly I guess okay that's a that's a different problem so the content import didn't didn't work properly sorry for that uh, bad demo but uh, but you can see that 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 comes up and uh, I can of course uh, switch for example to the German site um, and we see that. And uh, if I look at uh, the live site, that works as well. And we can see the URL structure here, corporate.12701 nipio corporate. And uh, again, I can switch, for example, to the German site. Um, and I actually get the right URL uh, for those as well. I didn't set up different hosts, uh, but I think you, you can you can see how the principle works uh, with that. Um, I think that's it for showing the demo. Um, we can come back to that if you have questions. Um, so let's uh, briefly talk about um, why not Helm. Um, after having had to work on complex Helm charts, I really hate Helm. I mean, Helm is great if you have something relatively straightforward that really works declaratively um, and you have basically the very limited number of Kubernetes resources that you're creating with Helm and there's very little uh, uh, variability in the, in, in the resources that you create. So it's basically certain values are replaced in the templates. Um, maybe you have a block, uh, an if block, or a for loop to create a couple of things, but um, very, very limited uh, amount of logic that you need to implement. And then Helm is okay. But um, 
the fact that Helm chose to use the Go template engine to create YAML files as text, it's just horrible because you run into all kinds of problems where that simply breaks down. The, the fact that you have to manually take care of the indentation uh, because it's a text template engine and the, the Go template engine does not actually understand that it's working to produce a YAML file. It's just, it's just wrong. And um, I mean, as I said early, uh, earlier, there, there's, there's a large number of um, uh, problems with having huge, uh, templates, it's, it's impossible to understand what's happening. And of course, it's uh, really, really hard to debug complex templates because Helm does not really provide good capabilities to do that. So, um, and, and one of the killer things that, that you cannot really do with a Helm chart is anything dynamic. So for example, if you want to run a proper uh, CAE feeder reset, including switching the solar cores, I, I don't know how you would be able to do that in Helm at all. And uh, the operator doesn't implement that just yet. Um, I have it uh, on the feature list of something to implement, but from the viewpoint of the operator, that is a relatively simple thing. I mean, you, it, the operator knows the state of all the components, um, it can talk to all the components and it can do the right things and properly report about what it's doing and what, what state the components are in right now and, and do that um, without too much trouble in a programming language that hopefully most of us understand. So um, that's that's much easier. And so, um, yeah, there, there, there isn't a lot um, to, to really do in Helm that, that would work well. So um, maybe the operator has its own problems, but uh, I feel it's still worth um, using and de developing the operator compared to, to a horribly clunky Helm chart. Um, that brings me to the summary, but before I do that, I wanna point out because I haven't really mentioned it so far. Uh, of course, this is an open source project. It's uh, on GitHub and uh, we welcome uh, your comments, contributions, issues, uh, pull requests. Um, there is a relatively long readme uh, and that explains how to get started using uh, the operator. Um, in the docs directory, there is a very long uh, description of what properties the custom resource has and uh, so there is a lot of things you can already do. And um, as you can see, many of these have, have sensible defaults. Um, and um, there is also a little bit uh, of documentation about customizing the Java code that the operator is. Um, and it's a Spring Boot application. It uses um, a framework called the Java Operator SDK. Um, and I specifically picked Java because I don't know Go. Um, and uh, I want to solve one problem and not two at the same time. So I decided it's hard enough to write a Kubernetes operator for the first time uh, without having to learn a completely new language and, and framework. So, um, and also I think since uh, I guess most people here are familiar with Java developing comedy applications, it makes a lot of sense to have the same language for the operator. And uh, it might, might seem wrong because everybody's talking about Kubernetes being developed in Go, but Kubernetes actually um, has, uh, uh, has a REST API and that is the main interface. So it doesn't actually matter uh, what language you write your Kubernetes client in and an operator from that point of view is just a client. Uh, Christian, was that a thumbs up or is there a question? Just a thumbs up, okay, excellent. Um, yeah, um, so there's a lot of stuff for you to read and get familiar with if you'd like to. Um, currently it's the operator has a few limitations that are briefly want to touch on. So it's Comedia 11, no Comedia 10, although it should be possible to make it work with 10 as well because the, the, the operator doesn't really know about Comedia 
in that detail. I mean, it's setting the right properties and everything, but I haven't tested it with 10. Uh, so if that is something that you need to do, um, that is probably possible to achieve. Um, and the other thing is um, this Java operator SDK um, should be able to deal with any Kubernetes resource, but I had trouble getting it to work with resource types that are not already defined in the SDK. So the SDK has predefined Java classes for all the standard Kubernetes things, uh, including, for example, the ingress objects. Um, and uh, that's the reason why right now only um, the uh, Nginx uh, ingress controller is supported because to use, uh, for example, traffic, you would need to create uh, custom traffic ingress objects, not the regular um, uh, ingress objects. Uh, because the uh, traffic stopped supporting annotations on ingress objects for rewrites, uh, you need to create um, uh, the, the, the proper traffic objects. And I couldn't get that to work with the version of the um, operator SDK that I'm using. A new version is out. I haven't had time to look at upgrading to that. I hope I can get to that in January or February. Um, and, and get all the versions updated to the newest versions and, and get that going um, to also support traffic and potentially additional ingress controllers. Um, so let's, let's maybe quickly see, there is a couple features, right? So support for traffic. Um, and uh, the, the last big thing in terms of scalability is automatically uh, configuring an HPA for the live CAEs. Um, that should be relatively straightforward, but uh, our current project has a, a fixed number of CPU licenses. So we can't really use an HPA for that anyway. So that was not really in the scope for, for my current project. Um, yeah, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>